I get messages sometimes from women in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Last time I got a message from a woman who was in her 70s and she said to me, I recently took up chess and I've been watching your videos and it made me so, so happy, you know. Uh, so it's not just young girls, uh, although I've been saying that. I think just anything that can inspire any, any girls or any women out there. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode number five of our FIDA podcast of Year of Women and Chess. In this podcast series, we'll introduce you to some amazing and inspiring women, including players, authors, coaches, journalists, and chess streamers. The podcast is a collaboration of the Chess Sports Association, the FIDA Women's Commission, and the German podcast Schachgeflüster. Today's guest was born and raised in Luxembourg. She presented her country in numerous Olympiads and championships, and since 2010 carries the title Woman International Master. Where she's not a chess professional per se, chess is still her profession. As a freelancer, she travels the world, attends chess tournaments as a player, but also as a commentator, press officer, or part of the media team. Many of you might also know her from her Twitch streams, where she's known under the name Fionn Ketta. I'm really pleased and honored to have WIM Fiona Stale Anthony as our guest today. Welcome, Fiona. Hey, Lily, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, and uh, it's my pleasure being here with you. Okay, Fiona, you were born and raised in Luxembourg, and as our audience and listeners are from all over the world, do you want to give us a quick into overview of, over where Luxembourg actually is, whether it's a large or small country, and a little bit maybe about the chess culture and the chess scene there? Sure, of course. So Luxembourg, I think a lot of people sometimes don't even, might not even know the country because it is uh, quite a small country. Even a lot of our neighboring countries don't know that much about us. They might know that we exist, of course, but uh, some I've had some friends uh, from, literally friends, which are next door neighbors, uh, who thought, you know, Luxembourg, it's just one city, which is our capital, Luxembourg City, so not so not so hard to remember. Uh, but no, there is quite a bit going on around that. So I live uh, in the south of the country, which the south is a bit more industrial and the north uh, has a lot of greenery. So it's more like farmland. So there's a lot of different stuff going on. And of course, the capital, probably best known for, for banking. Um, but yeah, our population uh, is growing. I think we're up to 600,000 now. I remember when I was a child, it was 400,000. So a lot of growth uh, on that end. But yeah, Luxembourg is just a, a nice little country in the center of Europe. Uh, if you don't know where it is, it's between France, Germany and Belgium. Much recommend you check it out uh, if you're ever in the, the area. And yeah, so this is where I where I grew up, where I started my, my chess playing uh, ways. And you ask me about what the chess culture was like. I think also a lot of people don't realize there is actually quite a, a bit going on once again because people think it is so small. Uh, disclaimer, it's probably not as small as you think. Uh, so we have a lot of different clubs. Uh, we have a chess league with different divisions. And while these days, I have to admit, I'm not so much in touch anymore. So I wouldn't uh, be able to tell you what exactly is going on. But when I was uh, growing up and started playing chess, there was an event pretty much every uh, every weekend, a lot of adult tournaments, but also a lot of uh, tournament for for junior players. Uh, so that's where I spent, you know, my, my weekends. And uh, I have very fond memories because uh, my best friends were, were all mostly from, from the chess world. So um, it was great fun, first of all, getting to play so much chess, but also uh, getting to spend so much time with my friends and yeah those were sort of my my first steps uh in in the chess scene and and in Luxembourg okay well thank you very much for the introduction um yeah my first question about you would basically be at what age did you play in chess how did you get into it how were you introduced to the game it's actually quite a, a funny story so um my father is a, a keen amateur player he isn't uh you know very a very strong player he's around 1600 something like that but uh, he discovered chess relatively late in his life but got incredibly passionate about it uh, so when i was around eight or nine years old i never know exactly he um 
he used to play at home and so he would either sit alone with his chessboard just looking at games with a with a book or sometimes he he had a friend coming over and they would sit in the living room and play some games um and i i was just i had been observing him for a while and so one day i said dad i i, I was really curious and i i said dad can you teach me and um so it all started from there, he started teaching me um, the rules. And I think he did a great job of uh, getting my interest in the best possible way. And I think it really helped me when I started playing chess. Like, we didn't immediately go to to all the pieces or to openings or something. Like, I remember very clearly that the first thing I learned was how to checkmate with a uh, queen against the bear king and then I learned how to checkmate with two rooks and then with one rook uh, which was a skill I felt was really helpful uh, to have when I started playing my first games Um, and yeah so I I really enjoyed uh, learning chess at home with my dad eventually playing uh, you know full games with him once I've mastered all the the checkmates Um, but then came the time when I had a friend, she, she was play uh, tournament uh, games already. And uh, my dad said, do you want to go and see her play the tournament, see what that's like? So remember, I'd only ever played uh, chess at home. So we went to, to see my friend and I have to say, I hated <laughs> I hated it at the tournament. Uh, I was only there as a spectator, but it felt so overwhelming. I I was absolutely not used to this feeling. Oh God, they are sitting there and everyone can look at the games. Um, I was used to, you know, nobody nobody's watching. I'm just sitting in my living room playing in my dad. And uh, when we when we left, I said to my my father, "I will never ever play a tournament." <laughs> <laughs> and I stuck with that only for I think maybe a couple of weeks until not my parents but some friends of mine who were playing convinced me they said come on it'll be fun uh, so they they did some work there and uh, they eventually convinced me and so I played my first tournament I, I guess I was uh, probably 10 years old and um, basically never looked looked back from there so uh, that was my my story for how it all, all started yeah I mean like you take it even further we'll talk about it later but nowadays you stream your games in front of like hundreds and thousands of people and do t- commentary and stuff yeah for sure a big a big step up from uh, from when I thought I didn't even want anyone to to look at me play chess <laughs> yeah yeah um i i read actually in several of your of your previous interviews that your dad was also the person who took you to your first kind of super tournament as a spectator um and that, that was quite an inspirational moment for you maybe you want to like talk a little bit about that yeah exactly so i i was lucky that from the moment it start if i started playing tournaments everything happened very fast uh, there were not too many uh, girls playing in luxembourg at the time so i very quickly made the national team you know got to play my first uh, youth world and european championships and very quickly got a a big uh, passion for for chess so it all happened very fast and then I believe it was in in 2001 uh, my father who had gone to a few super events asked me if I wanted to come along and of, of course I, I did and that tournament was Dortmund um, and I remember very fondly so I, I was 12, 12 years old at the time and I uh, I was um, fascinated to to sit in the public. I, I believe we all had like headphones with with the commentary, so that was really my my first experience of um, of seeing the best players in the world. And I, I remember I became a huge fan of uh, Alexander Morozovic, who who was playing there, and he had this flamboyant attacking style and I thought oh my god this is this guy is so cool he's such a cool player and uh, I also remember very fondly I had this tournament program where after every round when the players got up I would run to the stage and get their their autographs I still have that somewhere uh one of my probably my my nicest chess um memories of memorabilia uh so yeah that was um Definitely a moment that stayed with me forever, I would say. And I think it's it's quite cool 
um, to have such an inspirational event. And I think what's even cooler is that I heard that this year, actually, there will also be a tournament in Dortmund again, the Sparkassen Chess Trophy, and you'll be there again, but in a, in a kind of a very different role. Yes, so it's almost like things are coming full circle because uh, one of the organizers, Carsten uh, Hensel, when he contacted me about uh, working at the, the tournament, he had actually heard the podcast with uh, Michael and he said, you know, Fiona, I, I heard your story and I thought uh, it was really nice and would you be interested in, in coming to work with us? Uh, so I said yes and I'm uh, really excited to be going back. This is actually a the first time I'll be going back to, to the Dortmund tournament since I attended it as a 12-year-old uh, chess fan. And I will be doing, uh, among other things, commentary uh, alongside Grandmaster Artur Yusupov, which, uh, who I've never, I've never commentated with him. I've had the, the pleasure of interviewing him before. Uh, but so that's uh, really, really exciting uh, all around. And the commentary, you know which language this will be in? Is this going to be in English or German or a bit of everything? Because I know you speak so many languages. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be uh, in English because I think they want to... Uh, I think the tournament, you know, when I first attended, it was really one of the best super tournaments in the world. And then um, it sort of lost a little bit of its um i wouldn't say prestige but of its visibility on the international chess scene and um so i think they want to bring the tournament back up and i think from that point of view it makes sense to offer commentary that everyone um or most people can can follow yeah so we will make sure so this takes place in july and we'll make sure to link uh, the tournament and also the live commentary so where you find all the information in the description so in case anyone is interested to either go there and get some inspiration or at least listen to the commentary from afar they have a chance to find that thank you yeah i'm really looking really looking forward to to going back yeah and then maybe we can go a little bit more on your playing career again, I guess, because um, you said you mm -hmm. pretty quickly, once you started playing, started playing for the national team um, and managed to play a lot of like youth championships. But you also played the Olympiads uh, several times. I think you played the first time for the national team when you were just like 12 or 13. And since then, 13, yeah, haven't missed a single Olympia. Is that true? That is true. So yeah, I played my first first Olympiad in, in 2002 in Blade, Slovenia. Mm -hmm. And uh, funnily enough, I just received confirmation an hour ago. So literally just before our, our chat that um, I will be playing this year, I will actually be playing on the open team. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to, to field a, a women's team, but I will be uh, on the open team. So that will be Olympiad number Number 10 uh, in Chennai, India, uh, this, this summer. Well, congratulations for making the team. That's amazing news. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you maybe want to tell us a little bit? Because I think it's quite uncommon for females to play in the open team. Like, And as you played so many Olympiads, um, maybe can you tell us a little bit of whether you feel like the vibes are any different or whether like for you it makes a difference if you have ever, any preference in, in which team you're playing, whether you're in the women's or in the open? Well, I um, so what I played nine Olympiads and eight of those were on the women team only one time in, in 2010. I played on, on the open team and I think every time, well, the only time I played on the open team again was because unfortunately uh, we were not able to, to feel the women team. And um, I, I always enjoy, I think the Olympiads uh, is just, it's such a, a fun event and it's the event where you get to see all your friends from all over the world and also from a, a sporting perspective. I mean, it really is the, the Olympic Games of the, of the chess world and uh, in such, I feel it's a special event, especially because it takes place only every two years. Now, of course, with the pandemic, it's even been four years, so we've had a, a really long break. Now, for me, of course, I think in general, I don't mind playing. Uh, I'm happy playing on the open team. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it makes me sad that if I play on the open team, it means uh, that we weren't uh, able to, to field a, a women team. And I know this year uh, that is simply because we could not find um, five women or five girls or women who, who wanted to play. I know that. 
Uh, we, in fact, we only had had, had three, and uh, two of us are going to end up playing on the open team. So while I'm happy that I, I still get a chance to play, I think it's it's a sad state of affair that um, that we can't find five girls or women who want to play. So mixed feelings um, on that end. I, I know that that FIDE, I think, are really trying their best to to get every every country possible to, to send a, a women's uh, team. I, I believe this year, if I'm not mistaken, there is also uh, travel grants in place. Um, so yeah, it's just a, a big pity, of course, that we can't, uh, can't field a women's team because there is not enough interest. Um, but yeah, I guess that's a problem. That is also to do with maybe here in Luxembourg, especially a lot of people feel, uh, let me just get a, a normal job and, and chess is maybe not something that people want to to pursue that much. India, of course, is very far away. So there might be different factors, but um, all in all, uh, I'm happy to be going, happy to be on the open team, but very sad that we, we don't have a, a women's team. Hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense to have that double-edged feelings. I, I think it's pretty impressive because I, I feel like the fact that there is so few women or girls playing chess um, is like a general problem that we see in a lot of federations. And that seems something that's also the case in Luxembourg. But I feel like the women you have are incredibly strong. Yeah, especially for that reason, it's a, it's a pity. I mean, if we were able to, to field our strongest team... Um, I believe I would be on maybe the fourth board or mm. so. I mean, we would have a, a very, very strong uh, team, especially compared to our men's team. Our women's team would be a lot stronger, but um, some of the women, you know, they are mothers. Uh, I think one of our women grandmasters, she hasn't played in a long time, if I'm not mistaken. Her last Olympiad was in 2008. Um, then a friend of mine who was my roommate at the last Olympiad in 2018, she's also a very strong player. She was out uh, second board or top board at the time. She recently became a mother. So of course there is these factors. Um, and then we had a couple of young players who I believe now are just starting to go to, to university. So uh, there are these factors which are taking over. It also feels almost that it's a bit unlucky, the ages, you know. Mm. I'm never going to expect uh, someone who just became a mother literally a couple of months ago that they would now um, go to India to play chess for, for two weeks right after becoming a mom. And if you're just enrolling into uni university and... Um, but on the other hand, it is a pity that we don't have a, a wealth of players that we could choose from. Like just because two, three, four players can't make it, uh, it's crazy that that would mean we cannot feel the um, feel the team. And to be honest, sometimes I, I'm not too sure what what needs to be done. I think here in Luxembourg specifically, I think it's not just a problem uh, that we don't have enough girl players I think in general there is a problem that there hasn't been so much of a younger generation coming up not just with girls but also with with boys so I think in Luxembourg it's not so much a women specific problem uh, but rather a chess specific problem with n not enough young players uh, coming up and maybe chess in general not offering enough interesting prospects compared to um, just taking up a normal job. Luxembourg is one of the countries with the best salaries in the world. So I think a lot of people play chess for fun, but then when it gets more serious, um, are not so incentivized to, to spend more time uh, on chess rather than, you know, an academic career or pursuing a job. So there is all these factors and I'm getting very rambly, but as you say, it is it is a pity that we have these strong women players, but that nothing really comes up be behind uh, that from the next the next generation. So maybe it's also on us to get, to get together and with the federation and see how we can inspire uh, maybe some some girls. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how the chess like well, I guess like for all sports, but how that develops and how the Corona crisis and that not no clubs or something happened for such a long time will affect. But I guess like for chess, there's also some some positives because I think like the Queen's Gambit, but then also like this whole Twitch and things like that made made chess a, a quite a bit more cool or more approachable for young people or reached out to like completely new pools. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see.
Yeah, for sure. I think it's actually exactly how you're saying. I think online chess benefit benefited hugely uh, in a way from the pandemic, which is paradoxical. But um, I think a lot of clubs and uh, federations maybe suffered because it's it's challenging to to keep your activities going uh, online over such a long time period. So. Certainly, I think there were there were ups, uh, pros and, and cons uh, during this period for chess. Yeah. Well, we come to the reporting and the media a bit later because we know you're an absolute expert on this. But um, <laughs> one more question I actually have about um, you playing. So I, I saw that previously you played like so many tournaments and that it's like a bit less now, which I guess is partly because of the pandemic. But um, what was quite striking to me, and I wonder whether this is just by coincidence or whether you're more like a person that likes to play in a team. It seems that you're mostly playing in like olympiads but also like in the french women's league or the four nations chess league in the uk so a lot of team competitions is that like just by chance or because you prefer team competitions or because they don't intervene so much with your work in commentating which i guess is more often in opens and things like that yeah i think back in the day it was a lot more um you wouldn't notice it so much because i would play quite a uh, quite a lot um I would play still all these team competitions you're talking about, but also quite a lot of open tournaments. And I think that started shifting sometime around already 2014, 2015, which is uh, when I started my uh, my career, let's say, of commentating, etc. And these days, I just feel in the last few years, especially now with the pandemic, there just hasn't, well, for a while, there, there were barely any tournaments, but even already a little bit before, I think, uh, so much of my my life um, turned around chess that I, I just felt less of a a need or, or less of a, a wanting to to play so much because suddenly it just gets too much. Otherwise, if uh, your whole day to day, like the, the streaming, which is pretty much daily, and working at tournaments, and then I think when I have free time, I would rather maybe travel without playing a tournament or doing something else rather than than playing more chess so i think that's what um start led to to me playing less and then i think with the time i wanted to vote to devote to to chess it is true i mean all these teams my, my french team i've actually been playing for for over 20 years uh, the, for Aww. the same team the Ferenciel is a team that I, I've been captaining for the last uh, seven, seven, eight years already. So uh, I, I love those teams. I love playing on those teams. So I could never uh, drop those. And yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that just So that's how it goes. I, I just love playing those team events. And uh, it, it's funny because until you asked me the question, I had never thought of it consciously, but I thought you're absolutely correct. I mean... I literally could not tell you when I played an open tournament for the last for the last time, uh, which is quite telling. But yeah, I think because my I do limited playing, and those are the events that that I enjoy playing and that I've been a part of for so long. That that is just how it went. I'm not completely closed off to to playing open tournaments, but there just hasn't been that much opportunity or much thought given to it. Let's say. Yeah, and, and the teams, I mean, the social factor, I think it's it's a really nice motivation. For it can also sure. sometimes be stressful because I feel like you just don't just play for yourself. But if you have a good team, I mean, it's like priceless. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I've always, all my all my life, even ever since my childhood, um, I think the social aspect was a, a huge part of why I love chess so much. Of course, I loved the game itself, but I think the the social aspect was also always a, a huge uh, motivation and I think you're absolutely correct in that also playing a part of in why I, I love these uh, team team events. Love chess, love tennis. The Chess Sports Association involved in the production of this podcast is organizing an international chess tennis tournament from the 13th to 15th of August in Vienna, Austria. Sign-ups are still possible, so come join us for chess, sport and fun. The link is in the description below.
then maybe we can move on a little bit because you said you don't play so many opens and that doesn't mean you're not actually at them because it seems you're like at pretty much all the big tournaments. <laughs> um, so you're mostly nowadays, well, it seems like you're kind of doing a little bit of everything, like commentating, interviews, like the social media stuff. But how did you actually start getting into this side of chess? And was this like kind of a conscious decision or was this something that just developed over time? No, it was absolutely unconscious. So what had happened? Um, so I, I just said a second ago, around 2014, 15, there started to, to be a shift because up until that point, I would say especially in the period between maybe 2008 and 2014, so those were the years where I had just finished secondary and for a while I wasn't too sure what to pursue um, academic-wise. Uh, I did go for one year to uni, but I decided this wasn't for me. Then I took a year off, which left a lot of time, of obviously, for for chess. And then even when I, I did go back to university, um, my course... I think only had 20 hours of uh, lessons per week. So even that left a lot of time to, to play some tournaments on the side. So for those years, I think I was playing around 100 classical games um, per year. And it, it was just looking back, it was a lot, especially because I wasn't really putting the work in uh, on the side. So it was I think uh, not a great balance between playing too much and not working on my chess enough, um, which of course led to to the result you you would expect a uh, stagnation in terms of rating and then eventually even decline. And um, yeah, I think in 2014 I just realized I'm tired of playing so much and not only not making progress anymore but losing rating. And I was signed up to play at the Reykjavik Open that year. Uh, I had played there many times before. I was uh, on great terms with the organizer. So I shot them a message. Um, they were kindly providing me conditions, I believe, the hotel and maybe some the food. So I said to them, um, look, is it okay if I come? But instead of playing, maybe I could help you with some of the media stuff because obviously I still wanted to go. Um, but I thought, you know, because I have the conditions, if I if I'm not gonna play, I have to do something. I can't just go on a holiday, right? Uh, so I said to them, you know, maybe I can help you with taking some photos, maybe writing reports, a little bit of social media. And they said to me, sure. Uh, so I was really excited, um, but I was not expecting when I arrived on site. They said, would you also be open to doing some commentary, which I had never done. Um, but I said, sure, why not? So that was a, it was a crazy tournament because I really did do a little bit of everything. I did the commentary, but I also did the social media, also took some pictures, um, also did some interviews. So it was really the, the first time that I worked at a tournament, but immediately I, I got a glimpse of all the different aspects. And, um, and that's basically how it all, how it all started. And it just rolled on from there. You know, the chess world is quite a small world. And um, I think I already had a reasonably big network of knowing people. I'd been around the chess scene uh, for a long time, played a lot of tournaments, made a lot of contacts. So it basically all started there in Reykjavik uh, 20, 2014. And um, I finished my university degree in the summer of 2015. And then from there on out, it was it was clear to me that this is what I wanted, at least to try and do to try and do full time. And since you had the chance in Reykjavik to kind of like trial everything, has there kind of like been, do you know, by now have like things that you preferentially do or don't do so much, like writing articles or I don't know, interviewing or <laughs> are you just open to everything and like the versatility of everything? Yeah, it's it's funny you would ask that because I think that's one thing that I've never talked about so much uh, publicly, but I think it has become clear to me. Um, I'm open to still doing everything, but I think writing um, is probably what I enjoy the least. And I think these days also, it, it just, you don't get asked so much anymore because I think reports, people don't 
I think people read less and less, which maybe is a sad reflection of society. I'm not sure, but I think a lot of the content, people want quick content and ideally they want it in video form, you know, they can just press the play button and, and watch. So I think reports these days are anyway a lot more concise than they used to be. But I would say that probably my least, I think partly because I'm when I, I do something, I'm quite perfectionist. And uh, so very often I have memories of tournaments where I was doing other stuff as well. And then the report I would write once all the other stuff was done. And very often, you know, I would finish my report at 1 or 2 a.m. Um, and it just felt like, you know, I spent a lot of my night uh, writing this report, which probably not that many people are going to to read so yeah I would say that's probably my least uh, favorite but as I said it I, I don't do this so much anymore uh, these days I think also a lot of the stuff is social media it's Twitter it's you know 280 characters max so that takes a lot less a lot less time um, and I think my my favorite is is being uh, in front of the camera especially uh, well, to do commentary or, for example, in the Isle of Man uh, a few years back, I was hired solely to do interviews, which was the first time, um, you know, it also tells you about chess tournaments have some tournaments have grown so much and the production uh, has um, has grown so much because that specifically that Isle of Man tournament, I remembered a few years earlier. I was pretty much the only person on the media team and there was no live commentary, but I was doing everything else. And then a few years later, when I said I, I was hired solely to do interviews, there were suddenly 20 of us on the on the, the team doing the show and the social media. Um, so it's it's been really um, fantastic seeing chess grow and seeing chess coverage grow in, in that way. And it's... Um, it's been very exciting uh, being being a part of, of that journey. Yeah, I think it changed so much, like not just that the medium changed from a written form to like the live commentary and things like that. But as a viewer, I feel like even the interview style kind of in these videos changed a lot. Like they seem in the last two years to have got much more personal, much more tried to catch a person. Because again, as an amateur player, I remember as a child, I watched like Sometimes I read things or I looked at commentary and it was all like long variations that I couldn't even follow without a board. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel yeah. like nowadays they're much more for a broader audience. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think the chess world as a whole understood that people at home, of course, some people are interested in the variations. But as you say, there's a difference between a couple of crucial variations and discussing only variations 10 moves deep and nobody's quite sure of what's going on even you know I've I've been in that spot sometimes even the interview you just stand there and literally just nod your head because you have no idea <laughs> you know you have no idea what your interview is talking about um, <clears throat> so I, I think as you say there really has been a shift uh, and the chess world, I think, also has understood that a lot of the people, while they want to hear about the game, they also want to hear about, you know, who is this person maybe that I'm hearing uh, from and, you know, what is it like at the tournament and what's going on behind the scenes, you know, what are they up to when they're not at the board? And I think, uh, I, th I would like to think at least that in some ways, as a whole, as the chess world, we have managed to... Um, provide more of that content to to just give a bit more of a glimpse into yeah who are these people and what's going on at the tournament other than just on the board in terms of chess variations. Dear chess friends, here is Michael, the editor of this podcast series. Thanks very much for switching on. I'm very happy to be part of this collaboration for the benefit of the Year of Women in Chess. My German chess podcast Schachgeflüster is now sponsored by AIM Chess. Therefore, I would like to draw your attention to this great tool. AIM Chess is part of the Play Magnus group. On AIM Chess, you can enter your lead chess, your chess.com and your chess24 usernames. AIM Chess analyzes your online games for you. For example, they evaluate which openings you are successful with and how good your time management is. There are also valuable learning tools. 
You can, for example, practice positions where you blundered in the game. You can complete lessons in the training room. And you even get a personalized training plan. Just try out the whole thing for free. And if you want the full range of functions, then feel free to use the code SHACH30, SHACH30 to get a 30% discount for the first month of your premium account. Thanks again for listening. And now let's get back to Lily and Fiona. Do you have someone you prefer, like, do you have like a, a group of people, or I guess like single people, which, which you prefer interviewing a lot because they're just like easygoing and like it's, or, or other ones which are super difficult where you really have to take lanterns out or do you feel it's much more rather than a person depending on like, for example, the result they just had in a game before, I guess it's easier to interview someone that just played a good game. Yeah, I mean, it's uh I'm, well, I'm not going to name too many names. I think in general, there's always some people where you feel, oh, this is going to be easy. Some people are almost always uh, in a good mood. One of the things, I, I don't know if I've ever done it. I know that they want to start doing it or some people have started doing it. And I think maybe it's not a bad idea to interview losers, uh, people who have just lost a game. I've always found that a lot more challenging because when they come to you and you can clearly see they are depressed, it's just uh, very tough for me, at least very tough, you know, to, to ask these people, you know, where did it go wrong? Mm. Um, but I understand it's a, it's a part of sport. And I just think chess players, you know, um, and maybe even as interviewers, I think we're just not ready yet. I, I think, Uh, it's been part of other sports for much longer um, than it has in, in chess. So we'll see how that goes in a few years. But to come back to, to the original question, I think there are some players, um, for example, let's say Anish Giri. Uh, in general, he's a very... Um, he's very easy to interview because he will talk for a long time and he will just sort of give you all the information um so you never need to worry let's say oh is this interview going to be too short or am I going to struggle to you know I think for me at least and I've never talked about this so much without their interviews my main concern is what if they just give me a two-word answer and I run out of questions and the interview is only you know 30 seconds long but um so yeah so Anish for example is one name where that's never never a problem i think one of the the most challenging interviewees but also certainly the most interesting is magnus carlson because uh, magnus when when he's in a good mood uh he's fantastic i've had some great interviews with uh with magnus and you know when he's in a good mood he will give you Uh, so much to to work with and he's witty and he's funny but when he's in a bad mood it can be really really challenging and I, I've been there I mean I once interviewed him after he won a game but still I was only getting those two word answers <laughs> and uh, so yeah I mean at least he keeps you he keeps you on your toes and uh, he's one of the guys where you never know you never really know what to expect of course a couple more names people I love interviewing Grishuk, you yeah. never know. You never know what you're what you're gonna get. Can be challenging as well, but mostly just uh, a lot of fun. And Ivanchuk, Ivanchuk hasn't been so active lately, but uh, back in the day, I had the the chance of interviewing him a couple of times, and I, I have fantastic memories of that. I think in general, um, my feeling is that we're extremely lucky. I really, obviously, I would never name them if there, but there is nobody that I feel like. I hate interviewing this person. There genuinely isn't. And I think uh, on a whole, we're quite lucky in the chess world to have really interesting people and uh, polite players. And especially now the, the new gener generation uh, that's coming up, I have um, been fortunate enough, you know, some of them to be interviewing them uh, for a lot of years uh, throughout their growth. One of them who comes to mind is uh, Nihal Sarin uh, from India. And, you know, these, uh, a lot of these kids, although these days they're, they're teenagers, you know, they're soon to be adults. Um, but I just have very fond memories uh, of interviewing them. And as I say, I think uh, as a whole, we're very lucky in the chess world with the, the players that we have. 
Yeah, and and your answer also shows how difficult it is, and I guess like how much like tournament organizers can draw on your experience that you've interviewed so many of them before, and you kind of know their answer style and whether to prepare more or less questions. So it's pretty pretty cool to hear. Yeah, I I do think that a lot of um. I think when it comes to interviewing, a lot of my strength just literally draws on the experience of of having talked to these players before and maybe knowing them a little bit off the board, because I do think that obviously it helps, you know, if the player feels like feels at ease going into the interview and uh, if there's a good report and maybe you know some things about them. It's always going to help just make the interview that bit more, maybe more personal or a bit more interesting with some other information. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love interviewing players and I'm looking forward to it's been a, a while since my last interview, so I, I can't wait to, to return to that. Yeah. One question I had, because you interviewed so many of the top players and you've been to pretty much worked at so many of the big events. Is there anything you still have on your bucket list, like whether a person or a tournament, whether it's just because you think they're interesting or it's a great location that you'd really like to work at some point? Mm, that's a, a great question, actually. I hadn't uh, given it so much thought. Maybe... I Maybe one of the big events, like the candidates, I did attend uh, the candidates um, in 2018 in, in Berlin, uh, but I was working for Leecher, so it was more sort of behind the scenes, you know, doing my own thing. I think it would be a lot of fun to maybe be press office or be part of the official organization for a tournament like that and get to to interview the players really when the, the stakes are the highest. So maybe like a candidates tournament or world championship. Again, I was lucky to to attend the, the world championship in London again, 2018. Um, but I didn't have any direct contact uh, with the players. My work was more related to social media, etc. So I think if there was one thing would be one of those big ones, candidates or, or world championship and have direct access to the players because as a chess fan I, I love following those uh, events and yeah I just think they have more of that emotion and more you know more pressure and the stakes are so high so that would be that would be fun yeah yeah they, they, I, I mean like I saw the live commentary in some of the tournaments now and it, yeah I mean like as I said it, there's so much pressure and it's just so much so many viewers and it's like a super special atmosphere so fingers crossed that that will still work out but in general I have to say I've been very fortunate to to work at uh, almost all the the big events and yeah just very grateful for the all the organizers who who have put their their trust in me and Maybe one question uh, because you have been to so many tournaments and traveled so many places would you have any recommendations for tournaments for like amateur players would you say this is a great event that I could totally recommend you should go to I think the the top one that I always say is Reykjavik Open Reykjavik uh, Open holds a very special place in my heart because as uh, I said earlier it's the first where I sort of uh, made my first steps but I also, before I did that, I had played there uh, numerous times. I know it's quite an expensive uh, tournament to play because Iceland is an expensive tournament. But if you can save up and do it once, I think it's so worth it. Um, because first of all, the, the people are fantastic, uh, so welcoming, so friendly. And Iceland is just, for me, one of the most beautiful uh countries in the world the nature is so stunning so I, I recommend if you manage to go there uh, try and take a few days either before or after the tournament you know and just drive around and explore uh, the wilderness I've done this myself <laughs> numerous times I always try to go a bit early <clears throat> or stay a bit longer uh, other than that I think when I was still an active player I played one of these Greek sort of tournaments once I played in Paleojo I think uh, that's a uh, the Greek summer tournaments are great fun, especially if you're looking to mix um, holidays and chess because the rounds uh, were starting, I think, quite late at five five or six p.m. So plenty of time to to do something with your day. And there is a, a lot of these Greek tournaments in a row, so you could always pick one there. And then I might be a bit biased because my mother hails from Corsica, but there's some uh, really nice tournaments also being organized in in Corsica. Uh, where once again chess has really been booming and, and another stunning place so those would be some of my some of my recommendations 
They're all like a good mix between good, between good tournament <laughs> and good location. It's how, how maybe, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And maybe one last one to throw in is just Vaikansee. Uh, the last, so Tata Steel Chess, the last couple of years because of the pandemic, unfortunately, there were no amateur events. Uh, but I very much hope they will be back in 2023. And I think that's just such a unique opportunity to to play in the same playing hall as Magnus Carlsen. Uh, you don't get that. I mean, there's almost no tournaments where you get that opportunity. So that's another another one. Um, they have a lot of different events, weekend events, week events, uh, short ones, longer tournaments, or you can even just visit as a uh, as a visitor. So that's another one uh, for sure that I recommend highly. Yeah, yeah, that's some good recommendations. Um... I haven't been to any of them, so they're still on my list. Maybe I'll manage to go to one at some point. Yeah, plenty to add to the bucket list. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Okay, let's move away a little bit from uh, in-person tournaments, actually, and go a little bit to talk about Twitch, because mm -hmm. um, Twitch got actually really big the last few years and is basically a live streaming platform for all kinds of video games where users basically interact with the streamers through chat, so it's quite interactive compared to videos. And chess experienced this huge hype on Twitch during the past two years, I would say, through Corona. But I actually saw that you've been streaming for nearly five and a half years or something now. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I got there. I got there nice and early, but then the first few years, I I wasn't that active. I actually started streaming in um, towards the end of 2016, and the reason I started streaming was because of my my English team, which brings us back to you know those team events. We had qualified to play in the um, European Club Cup. But uh, we didn't have a sponsor, we didn't have... So I wanted to try and raise the money to at least cover, uh, cover our travel expenses and accommodation. So that's how the idea of uh, Twitch was born. I was also uh, inspired at the time by one of my best friends, Simon Williams, aka the Ginger GM, who was really one of the early... Uh, the early trailblazers, I would say, on Twitch. So, yeah, started in 2016, which is some fundraiser streams for our team and some collaborations with uh, Simon. And it's so, I mean, to me, it's just incredible when I compare uh, how things were back then to how they are now. I mean, I have never seen anything like this. At the time, there were maybe, I would say, maybe 10 of us, you know, chess streamers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these days, I mean, at any given time, there were, you know, around 50 people at least streaming chess. So it's just been absolutely uh, insane, the growth in terms of pure numbers, but also to see, you know, uh, some of the best players in the world joining streaming. The best example, of course, is Hikaru. Uh, so, yeah, it's just been um, been quite the journey, let's say, for, for chess on Twitch. And do you feel, so I assume your viewers also must have increased a lot during the Corona crisis because there were more streamers, but also more viewers. Mm, how do you think Twitch will, or like, I guess it's already like now a lot of countries are opening up and the Corona rules are easing. Do you think this will still be something that will stick around or it'll kind of decrease again? Yeah, I, I think we have already started seeing the decrease for, I would say for a few months. I think, as you say, with uh, regulations being relaxed, but also with, you know, the weather outside getting nicer, uh, I think people are eager and, and I don't blame them, you know, just to return to a normal life, you know, go out, see friends, um, especially now with summer coming, enjoy the, the nice weather. So I, I think we've definitely seen the decrease already. And I think it's normal, you know, if uh, what goes up must come down kind of thing, like these waves, they can never stay, you know, the hype can never last forever. But I don't think that means that it's going to go away completely. I think we're just now sort of on a, a, da a bit of a down wave uh again but there will be there will be winter again hopefully there will not be another corona wave that's not what i'm hoping for um i heard rumors that there might be a queen's gambit part two so i think chess um you know it's been there for thousands of years and i think it's here it's here to say so i think there will always be factors i, I even now, maybe in a month, I think the candidates tournament is going to uh, generate a lot of interest, I'm, I'm sure. And as I say, you know, maybe a bigger 
wave will come again if there is a Queen's Gambit part two or other factors. So I, I'm quite positive about the future. And I think that it's normal that there will always be some, some lulls like I think we're experiencing now. But I think all in all, the, the future is still still bright for, for chess on Twitch. Yeah, I think it's, it's super interesting because also it reached out to such a new audience. Like there were so many both like beginning streamers, like streamers that are like beginners. But as I said, like also the complete opposite with Hikaru, like super strong players and also the audience that it was people that kind of never watched chess before. And I guess at the beginning, at least in Germany, was the beta quite heatedly, whether this is mm -hmm. kind of like the right way to go forward with the chess or whether we should keep it because like the level then was like not as high in some of the streams and like some of the more mm, settled chess player were very upset about this I guess mm -hmm. but yeah I personally think it was a great game for the chess world for sure and I think the most controversial of a point of what you're you're talking about came with the the Pog champs mm -hmm. uh tournaments that were put on by by chess.com and I, th I think as you say you know a lot of people there was a lot of gatekeeping of like what are they doing to chess like we don't want to but I thought they were great events and all these like I genuinely not just thought oh they're great uh, content creators and this is great for chess which of course it was but I enjoyed watching these people because a lot of them uh, genuinely tried to to improve and put a lot of work in and I thought it was super super interesting uh, from that point of view as well and I didn't understand the people who were criticizing it so much because I mean there is so much chess content out there if this is not your cup of tea like just don't don't watch it it's not it's not like Puck Champs was suddenly the only content out there which maybe that would be a problem but um I thought it was uh great for what it did for for chess and I also felt that if I uh, the effect of you know the the audience changing I remember at some point a few years back I almost felt the people who watch my stream on average are, are as strong as me. I, I Sometimes, you know, I would have chess discussions and it felt like this is such a high, like the community is so, are such strong players as a whole. While these days I'm very happy, you know, to have a, a lot of uh, people watching me who are rated under a thousand or just starting out. And I, I'm very happy that it's more a diverse community and um, it's great to see people supporting each other, you know, the more experienced, stronger players, you know, giving tips, helping out uh, those who want to learn who are just starting out. So I think it's really important uh, to, to have that diversity and to also provide content for, for everyone. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the diversity of the chess content we have nowadays. There's something for like super complicated analysis and there's something for beginners. And I think it's absolutely great. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, we'll for sure link your Twitch details uh, in the description below. So uh, if people want to check out Fiona's Twitch streams, there are loads of fun to watch. Uh, please do so. One point I appreciate I want to... the shout out. <laughs> yeah. One point I want to catch up on because I actually haven't heard this about the Queen's Gambit <laughs> follow up. <laughs> um, because um, I also saw that you actually put a post out or like a little poll, I guess, like for um, the defamation lawsuit against Netflix for Queen's mm -hmm. Gambit. Um, yeah, and I wondered again, like what what your position is on this. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's something we haven't heard about it for, for a while. I, at the time, felt quite strongly that if I was Nona Gaprindashvili, to be honest, I would be pissed off mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I do not understand what the need was to to belittle her achievements or to, to minimize them. Um, I mean, either use a made-up name or if you want to use her real name, uh, then don't change, diminish her accomplishments. And I was especially shocked if you have, um, if you have advisors like Gary Kasparov, I mean, maybe like there's a lot of course that they have to pay attention to. But for me, this was something that I just felt, um, this is just not okay. Like either use a made up persona and then you can say whatever you want you know but don't say oh this was adapted for fiction I mean then don't don't use her her actual name and um yeah I'm not sure if the, the lawsuit is over I sort of lost uh lost 
I haven't heard anything about it, but yeah, I I hope she she wins or at least that they change. Um, maybe they can edit something or at least at the very least apologize to her. Yeah, or at least I guess even if that doesn't happen, I guess now their newspaper article is out that like at least say this is not the case, which which I already thought was quite quite good for people that don't play chess so they know. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then maybe one thing uh, on a personal level, moving away from from Twitch, I'm not even sure how many people know these things, but you used to make these vlogs, Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) which are kind of like these video blogs where you kind of take viewers to these big tournaments, show them behind the scenes, and um, there haven't been any in a while. And I was wondering if this was because of Corona or if this is something you're not planning to do anytime soon because there's so much work. Because I, I personally really, really love them. They give such a great view behind the scenes and like what these tournaments are like. And I guess like gave a view on the whole the friendship perspective and mm-hmm. meeting friends and stuff like that. No, I think the vlogs are probably my favorite content that I've ever uh, put out. But I have to, I mean... The main reason that they are not happening anymore, of course, I haven't filmed much, as you said, you know, with the pandemic, I didn't go to as many tournaments as before, uh, but also the the vlogs, I only did the easy part, which was filming. Uh, mm-hmm. I think they were really brilliantly edited uh, by my friend and editor Anton Squared Me, but uh, he got really, really quite busy with work. And the problem was uh, with these vlogs, uh, there was so much of his time going into it for for relatively little, like the audiences were, were quite small. So there is still some footage uh, that he has. I believe part two from Norway Chess 2020 is still <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> so someday we want to, to get around to, to publishing that at least. I also filmed in, in Tata Steel last year, but looking back, I, I think the footage is not that exciting because... Uh, a lot of these tournaments, you know, during the pandemic, there just wasn't much going on outside uh, outside of the board. You just, okay, you play, you go back to your room. So that's, of course, not what I uh, wanted to do. But yeah, the vlogs, I, I'm glad you mentioned them. If, if people want to get a glimpse, I think they were, um, like, of course, it's not for me to say they were great, but they were a lot of fun to do. And I do think... They give at least a little bit of uh, of a look of what go goes on at these tournaments um, when the people are not playing, and I think people sometimes might be surprised that there's quite a lot of socializing going on, but between the players and maybe you know uh, the staff, and so yeah, they were they were a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully someday they will they will make a comeback. I make sure to also link them in the description. As I said, like for me, they gave a, a great inside view into the whole tournament and what it's like. And uh, it, it really motivates to go to these. For me, <laughs> where I also go to like a lot of few things for not just the chess, but also the social stuff. It is a great motivation and it was very cool to see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we don't have that much time left. So maybe just two more questions. First of mm-hmm. all... Um, now that I guess like all the tournaments are restarting, we already heard that the Sparkassen Chess Trophy in Dortmund will be one of your next stop. Where, which other events have you already planned for this year? Or where will we be able to see you? Uh, in two two days from now, so I think by the time this gets published, I might be I might be back already. But I'm going to uh, to Sharjah in the United Arab uh, Emirates. There is a very strong tournament uh, taking place there. I haven't been, I played in Sharjah myself in 2014, but it will be the first time I work there. I will be doing some interviews on social media. So uh, that I'm very much uh, looking forward to. After that, you talked about them. I have a couple of more team events uh, coming up in June. I will be playing in the the French League. End of June is the final weekend of the, the English League. Um, and then there is only Dortmund before before the big one, of course, the, the Chess Olympiad. I am super excited that the Olympiad is back after four years. I've never been to India. Uh, so I'm really, lo- really looking forward to that. And after that, like it's very busy until then. After that, I haven't made too many plans, but I'm sure something will come up for, for the end of the year as well. Hopefully a bit of a break after that. But yeah, sounds amazing. <laughs> we'll cross our fingers for your tournaments that they all go well. Thank you so much, Lily. And then one final question, because this podcast is part of the Feed a Year of Women in Chess 
kind of what would you as a player or also a professional like li making a living from chess what other ideas events which other support would you like to see from FIDE to support women in chess well first of all I, I think it's a great initiative to to have this um this year of of women in chess it's hard to it's hard to I don't have any concrete ideas but I think anything that will give young girls uh you know female role models to look up to and I, I'm very happy to to be on this podcast for that that reason um I I think a lot of us women players or women who work in chess like if I can only inspire one girl or two girls you know I, I feel that makes me really happy and uh, so I think anything um maybe even some some tournaments you know this this experience that I had in Dortmund when I was young uh, left such a deep impression on me so you know maybe some some I think we're still lacking a lot of uh women super tournaments uh in Europe so if if like when I was young back then in Dortmund if this could be a tournament with the best players in the world and if you had the opportunity to approach them you know uh, maybe ask them some questions maybe have some lectures around I think anything that that just gives girls um, more role models to look up to but I think especially it's also important if they can interact uh, more actively with them so uh, it's very vague <laughs> in my head but yeah I think just giving young girls everywhere and not just young girls you know I get messages sometimes from women in their 40s 50s 60s last time I got a woman a message from a woman who was in her 70s and she said to me I recently took up chess and I've been watching your videos and it made me so so happy you know uh, so it's not just young girls uh, although I've been saying that I think just anything that can inspire any any girls or any women out there uh you know to to not just take up chess but fall in love with it more and uh give them more people to to interact with and hear a bit more about what goes on in the the women's chess world so yeah very rambly answer but those are some of my thoughts no i think it was a really good answer very inspirational uh i think it's a perfect ending to our podcast because we're unfortunately at the end of the time But yeah, it was an absolute pleasure having you here, Fiona. Thanks for giving us such great insights into both your life, but also like the the kind of like the chess world, the the life of like top chess players and these great tournaments. And yeah, hopefully we'll see much more of you in the future in some commentary and hopefully some vlogs. Thank you so much, Lily. It was my pleasure uh, being here. And yeah, as I said, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>